Fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I'm really excited. This is the very last technical session of NI Week. So uh, thanks for sticking around this long. When I found out, I was joking that maybe they saved the best for last. Uh, so hopefully that'll happen. I'll do my best. All right. So uh, today, we're going to be talking uh, about the Karaya uh, framework tool. I say framework. It's not big. It's not complicated. You don't have to be a CLA to use it. Uh, we actually hope uh, that it's accessible to uh, maybe even first-time LabVIEW developers. And it's, it's really a new take on unit testing in LabVIEW. There are some tools available out there. I'll talk about those briefly. And I'll be talking about what's different, um, pros, cons, um, and about unit testing in general. Uh, also, uh, you know, I, I love at answering questions. Um, I'm going to kind of go through a quick workflow, and at the end, uh, I, I will have opportunities to hang out and answer questions as well. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, let's dive in. So I'll start off by mentioning that I work at JKI, and our whole business model is about accelerating R&D. Uh, we've been working hard over many years to help even uh, do faster lab view development. Uh, we're really passionate about helping scientists and engineers get innovative technology to market with speed and impact. Uh, if you're going to be shipping lab view code, you should probably do some kind of automated software testing. Highly recommend it. Um, we'll talk about why, but it ends up being pretty critical. Now, at the same time, we want to we want to get the product shipped quickly, of course, and adding unit tests can slow slow down that process. You don't want to write twice as much code, right? Because uh, that would presumably take twice as long. So uh, there's definitely a balance there. So actually, Karaya, as we'll we'll learn, aims to help uh, accelerate the rate at which you can create high quality code by allowing you to write your tests faster. All right, so the agenda today, I'm going to talk just uh, briefly about uh, software unit testing. Who has done some kind of software unit testing before? Awesome. So I'm speaking to experts. Uh, I might actually learn something from you guys if you guys have uh, good questions, which I'm sure you will. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the different tools in LabVIEW for unit testing. You guys have probably uh, used some, if not all of them already. Some of you guys. Who's used Karaya already? Okay, cool. So there's some folks in the room who have. Uh, I guess a majority in the room haven't. So this will be new content, which means it should be hopefully interesting to all of you. Okay, but first a demo. Um, I always love it when uh, presentations have uh, get into showing some code right away. So I'm, I'm going to give you a little kind of preview of what Karaya is, hopefully that drives home the point, and hopefully that makes everybody in the room really happy because we're all LabVIEW developers and we want to see some LabVIEW code. So uh, for this demo, I have a simple LabVIEW project. I'm going to minimize some of this stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new VI and I'm going to start writing some code. Um, I'm going to write a VI that says, hello, unit testing world. There we go. I'm going to save it. This is going to be my hello world BI. I'll create an indicator for this guy. And I'm going to wire it up. I need that probably. Wire it up here as an output. Save. I'm going to close that guy. And I'm going to create a new VI. That's, that's going to call this. So I'll, I'll drop my hello world. You'll forgive me for not having an, an awesome icon. Um, and we will actually, let's just run this VI and run it and we see that it says hello unit testing world. So we've written our first VI right in LabVIEW. LabVIEW is amazingly fast to write code. Nobody in here is impressed because you do this all day long. Okay, so we'll sa save that again. Now, Let's say that I want to uh, do some testing uh, of this code. I'm going to pop up here, and I'm going to assert equal. 
Oh, wrong one. Actually, the first thing I need to do is install Karaya. So I'm going to Bing Karaya. OK, good. And I'm going to click Install. So this is what you can do when you get home. You can Google or Bing Karaya. Click Install. Hit Yes. Next, next, next. Easy, easy. Showing the palettes. And Bing. All right, cool. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to define a little test here. And I'm going to say that this is it's my hello world unit test. And I'm going to wire up the error. Oh, there's no error here. Um, that's actually OK in this case. And I'm going to assert, oh, not assert true. I'm going to do an equality check here. And I'm going to check to see if the output there is equal to, I'm just going to create a constant. Oh, actually, hold on. Here we go. And I will run the test, and my test failed. And I can kind of go in here and just probe what's going on here. And what I see is basically that those values weren't equal. It was a capital instead of a lowercase. So I'm going to fix my bug and rerun this, and you can see that it passed. So, the idea is just by dropping uh, a couple VIs, I've defined a test, and I've, I've compared my expected result to my actual result, and it, it just worked. Uh, and it was uh, very simple to do that. And you can see, um, I mean, writing all that code probably took like three minutes, two, three minutes to kind of get started with unit testing. So I'm going to jump back into the presentation to Hopefully everybody's smiling. Right. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what just happened in that demo. Like, what was my workflow? What did I do? Why is it important? So we'll start by, uh -oh. there we go, talking about unit testing. So you guys are all unit testing experts. So I'm going to tell you some things you already know. First of all, why should you test your code? Firstly, because you already do. So you're already testing your code. What, what often happens when you're writing some DIs that, that maybe do some sort of, um, let's say, signal processing, you often have some kind of like data, some constant, a front panel control value, or a file that's got some data. And, and you're using that to test the, anal the, the processing routine, and then you're comparing, probably, uh, you're, you're looking at the output and probably checking to see visually, does that work quite right? At least that's how I do a lot of my coding. I know there's some folks that uh, are probably, you know, 10 times smarter than me that look at the spec and know how everything works, and they write all the code, and they double check it, triple check it, until it works, and then they say, okay, let's try it. Yeah, it works. Um, I don't do that. So uh, what I do is I'll, I'll often kind of interactively write some code that actually tests the code that I'm trying to write. So wouldn't it be nice if that code that I was writing could just kind of be a unit test? That seems pretty attractive to me. Uh, improve the code quality, obviously. If, if you're testing things, you're going to improve quality. I don't think I have to talk about that one too much. Uh, improves the software design. Hmm. So I, I believe that if you are creating a test VI that calls your sub-VI, your component, you are becoming the first user of your component. And you're thinking about what are the inputs, what are the outputs, are there any preconditions for calling this function? Maybe I have to do a, like a setup function if I'm doing some sort of object 
need to create an, an initialized object to pass in. Um, and I might add a little documentation of what I've been doing. Um, so that process is actually um, creating some code, which is the customer, the user, developer user, of that little block of code. And we are now having some documentation of how it's intended to be called. That's like API documentation. And we're starting to design the interface. Uh, and we're also creating some documentation that test kind of becomes the requirements for the VI under test. Um, and what I really like uh, about LabVIEW is that in a lot of ways, uh, the code uh, facilitates self-documentation. That doesn't mean the code's going to document itself, but if you add good kind of documentation that's also code and you get other value out of it, then the code is kind of self-documented. So I like that, and it promotes good software design. Uh, there's also this concept of test-driven development. And if you work in teams, you can have, you know, put somebody who kind of knows what, what they want. They're the designer of a component. Um, not necessarily the guts, the implementation, but they know, like, what the interface should look like, what functionality should be under the hood. They can actually create the test first with some empty sub VIs, which are just, let's say, a template or a scaffold for a developer implementing that to actually write the code. So that test-driven development allows us to create a, a functional test, which adds some value to the project as documentation and other things. But then that also becomes a set of requirements for the component developer to know when they hit the go button on run the test. You know, if they get that big green check mark, that means their job's done. They've actually fulfilled the requirements of the tests. It also allows refactoring. So uh, we may want to refactor our code, these low-level components or modules that we have tests for, because we wrote tests. And uh, if we, let's say, try to performance optimize or memory optimize or upgrade lab view to 2016, because you're all going to do that when you get home, right? And you want to know, does my component still work? Um, and it would be really nice if you could just hit one button and then have it quickly tell you that, yes, it still meets all of the requirements, meaning all of the tests that we wrote that validate the functionality of that component. And uh, I have worked on uh, projects where we're developing components, um, and we have kind of a good set of specs for how those sub-VIs are supposed to work. And we've had to you know, ship them out to customers and then ultimately fix bugs for them, add new features, refactor for performance. And literally, we could not have, have done that code maintenance um, without automated testing. It would have, I, I, we'd still be fixing bugs and manually testing things right now. So it's absolutely critical for, for software engineering to write tests. The other thing too, part of that idea of being able to automate the regression tests is it really does give complete ownership of all parts of the code to all team members working on the project. I think what, what can happen when we're working on a project with other developers and there's no way to, in an automated way, test fixes to the code, I think I know I feel pretty hesitant to touch somebody else's code if I didn't know how it was intended to be used and I don't know everywhere that it is being used. And you know, I, I really feel a need to kind of think about, okay, what could possibly go wrong about this little change that I'm trying to make and is there another bit of code that maybe relies on that bug or something like that. So if I have one button that I can press to essentially run all my tests, I can feel confident in making that change that it's not going to break anything. And actually, if it does break something, I would say, okay, well, we didn't have a test for that. So let's just go add a test for that right now. And thanks, you've just found a potential uh, corner case that we weren't actually having test coverage for. So it's good that we find that out now because that might also affect somebody else. And then we'll add that to our test suite. And then uh, our, our our product will be more robust, more reliable. And that sort of workflow is actually part of like validation processes if you're using, um, if you're writing software for any sort of regulated environment like medical or, or other. Okay, 
So unit testing in LabVIEW, you all unit test in LabVIEW, so you've seen some of this stuff. Who has used VI Tester? Awesome. And who has used the LabVIEW unit test framework? Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the differences between the two. Um, VI Tester is, is modeled after the, uh, the X unit framework, which is an object-oriented framework. And it, VI Tester is written purely in LabVIEW using LabVIEW objects. And this framework has an object called a test suite, which is simply an aggregation of other test suites and test cases. Test cases are classes whose methods are test methods. And when you run a, a test case, basically the framework runs all of the, the test methods. And you can basically override setup and teardown methods to initialize all your um, objects that need to be initialized uh, in the setup and, and destroy them in the teardown. And it's a very nice, elegant architecture. It, it lends itself extremely well to testing object-oriented applications. Because if you're going to be testing object-oriented oriented applications, what one finds is when they're writing tests, there's similar types of code reuse that's necessary. On the test side, you end up having a hierarchy of tests that's kind of homologous to the hierarchy of objects in your application. So I won't get into the details, but it's extremely powerful, really useful for testing object-oriented applications. The LabVIEW unit test framework is a feature built into LabVIEW. Um, it's not written in LabVIEW, but it's kind of part of the LabVIEW IDE, just like LabVIEW under the hood is written in C++. I'm assuming the LabVIEW unit test framework similarly. Um, the LabVIEW unit test framework has some really nice uh, IDE, LabVIEW IDE integration, and it makes it really easy to create test vectors and um, your test outputs uh, and test across a wide variety of test vectors. And it also um, helps you determine your code coverage. I think it does some kind of static analysis to determine what areas of your code actually have been tested. It kind of looks inside the code paths, uh, which is kind of cool. Also really useful in like a regulated, validated environment where you actually care to be able to validate that like every possible code path that could execute in our project has a test for it. Um, uh, there are disadvantages of that uh, too. I won't go too much into the disadvantages. I'll just kind of tell you uh, what Karaya was really designed for. Um, next. So uh, we'll get into some of the obstacles, and these are just kind of generic obstacles, not really picking on VI Tester or picking on the LabVIEW unit test framework. So first of all, context switching when stepping out of the LabVIEW IDE or kind of your, your workflow. If, if to write a test, we have to really kind of set everything down, start up some other tool, and, and now I'm in sort of like test writing mode, and, and if, it's, if it's slow and it takes a lot of time, um, that's, that, that context switch really kind of slows down the rate at which we can write, write our code. Um, and again, to slow opening the test framework, if it's a large effort to write simple tests. Um, I will pick on VI Tester. I, I wrote a lot of VI Tester. Uh, it's object oriented. If you want to test a single VI, you need to create a class, a test case class, um, which basically kind of comes from a template. And then you need to create a test method. You possibly need to like look at the setup and the teardown write your code, you have to drop some VIs in there, uh, wire some things up. There's probably you know, several more steps than what I showed you in the demo at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and there's also a lot of benefits. You know, It's like it's kind of hard writing a, an application using Actor Framework uh, if, let's say, you're just kind of wanting to get something started really quickly. Um, much more effort than just dropping a few simple VIs. Okay. Um, also, too, slow running of tests. Uh, we wanted to create something that was quick. All right, so introducing to a lot of you in the room uh, the Karaya uh, unit test framework. 
And that is up on GitHub. It is open source. You can look at everything under the hood. It's a BSD license, which is super friendly for anything you'll want to do. Uh, so check that out. I will also give a huge shout out to Tommy Myla, one of our partners and a principal engineer at JKI, who designed the Karaya framework. And I'll give you Tommy's uh, contact information too. If you, you're interested in collaborating on Karaya, you've got ideas for making it better, uh, GitHub is super easy. You can actually fork the code, make your changes, and do a pull request. And, and that sends us messages that we can merge your changes into the master branch. It's really cool. You can submit bugs. Um, so check it out. So now getting into Karaya's design goals. Flow. So um, Jeff was talking about the reason why we love LabVIEW and it gets us high, right, is we, we get into sort of these flow experiences of like deep immersion into the wires and it's just, it's really fun and we get our heads wrapped around what we're doing and uh, I, I know I, I really enjoy getting into kind of those, those flow moments. And so we want to stay in the flow. We want something that doesn't get in the way. So we really wanted to avoid the context switching, and we, we felt that, well, could your VI be your test? We also wanted it to be very fast, good performance, uh, both in terms of the actual kind of running of the test, but also fast just to kind of, you know, if, if I'm writing, if I'm in lab, you're writing my project, and I want to quickly just run all my tests, it should be kind of quick to get there and do that in addition to the time to actually run the tests. And then also keeping it simple and intuitive. Uh, VI Tester really addresses the need for highly object-oriented uh, testing of highly object-oriented applications. Um, which is neither s simple nor intuitive to your just average getting started LabVIEW developer. Um, and then the NI unit test framework is more kind of, in my opinion, kind of geared towards validation and stuff, which is also kind of a very focused use case. Um, so when uh, Karai was designed, it was designed to achieve those things. So you, you might have been wondering, you know, what's up with the C icon logo? And, and what is a Karaya? This is kind of fun. So the Karaya is uh, another name for the black howler monkey, even though this guy is kind of redhead. Sometimes they get sort of redhead. Um, and they see a scary lion. And they make howling noise. You guys hear that? So uh, we, we wanted to make something where the, the test framework would see your broken code. <laughs> so uh, you, you can leave that feature off if you don't want that sound coming from your cubicle and all your, your coworkers wondering if you've gone mad. Uh, so as you can see, it's, it's got a pretty uh, simple palette. And the UI design is, is pretty simple. Uh, and you literally run your test by just hitting the run button on the VI, which is your test. OK, so I'm going to show you guys uh, another demo here, which is a little bit more in depth. And this one, let me save this. Okay, so uh, this morning we just released on our blog a JSON parsing library. And so uh, this library is a, a dynamic parser. And so it can actually take uh, kind of arbitrary JSON 
and it'll give you uh, basically kind of an arbitrary variant and you don't really need to define all the data types. Uh, this was also written by Tommy, the, the cool guy whose picture I showed you guys. And uh, we released this this morning. It's available on GitHub and it was designed to um, allow people to very flexibly work with JSON. How many people have worked with JSON? Okay, you guys know that. It's sort of like what people are using now when they used to use XML. JSON's a little better and it's quickly becoming kind of like the, um, the format for data being shared over kind of the internet. Uh, and it's very kind of cross-platform, cross-development uh, environment. Um, so uh, you can read more uh, about this here on our blog. You can see kind of some of the reasoning, some of the tools. I'm actually, I am kind of doing a plug for it because I think it's a cool tool and it's open source. Um, but then also, uh, it's something you can get the source code for, and I just checked it out from GitHub this morning. And I'll open it in Explorer, and I will open the project here. And I have already applied the package configuration. Have you guys used VIPM to apply package configurations and stuff? So this comes with a VIPC file. Um, I've already applied all the packages. It also includes kind of Unicode, uh, package that uh, JKI developed that's also open source. Um, but that just makes sure you have all the dependencies. And here you can see uh, some of the VIs that are in there that have been written, the unflatten and the flatten functions. You can see there's a lot of code in here. So if, if we're going to be creating a component like a JSON serialization and deserialization tool, you probably want to test it with a lot of different conditions that basically validate that we meet all of the, uh, the, the syntax parsing requirements for JSON, that we handle all of the LabVIEW data types, we haven't made any mistakes uh, with anything. And I'll tell you, when, when, when this code was written, uh, there were a lot of bugs throughout the development cycle. You know, how do we, are we handling recursion properly? Um, or are we handling recursion in these weird little corner cases? Um, and those can be extremely hard uh, to, to track down. And actually, at the very, very end, there was like one tiny nagging bug where we had to take a variant and actually use the two variant function to make it a variant inside of a variant because of just how the recursion worked. And, but instead we just have the variant. And those little things would be like really tricky to actually kind of track down all that stuff without a good suite of unit tests. So Tommy, being a good software engineer and who also happened to be the author of the Toraya framework said, I'm going to create a bunch of tests. So what, the way that we do that in Karaya, and kind of this, this will get into uh, kind of where we left off, from the first demo is you can see that we're calling this uh, define test function here. And the define test just really registers the calling VI as a test. And inside of here are three sub VIs that are themselves calling the defined test. And you can see we haven't actually yet called any of the assertion functions that are doing the, the comparison, but we're, we're just starting to kind of group our tests hierarchical, hierarchically. And you can see finally, finally here, we're getting down to some actual tests. And so this is testing the round trip of complex clusters. And we have some partially matching schemas. And I can see what, you know, Tommy's just testing some, some variations in the data types. Uh, testing converting enums to numeric types, uh, enums with strings. Uh, so there's a lot of different corner cases and features we want to test. And so I can go down to this one VI, which is test round trip complex clusters. And you can see this one VI, because it actually had several different assertion calls, shows up as several different individual tests underneath round trip complex clusters. 
So I'll go up the stack and I'll go down here to test round trip enumeration. You can see similarly we've got four individual test assertions. And I can just open the VI and run it. And it's, a, it's very natural because now when I'm in my code just working, I can just hit the run button to run the tests. So if we wrap or if we call two of these different tests in a parent VI and register that parent as a test, what we'll see now, round trip serialization actually has two kind of subtests that have themselves tests underneath. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, um, so those are just some, some icons that indicate whether or not the tests have been run or whether they failed and passed. Um, Uh, so, if if I break if I break the VI here by let's say just having no data, hopefully that works. Okay, constant. Oh, apparently that wasn't good enough to break it. Um, Oh, because it's, it's maybe testing type, so if I do something like that, does that work? I'm just making a guess here. The, the code is also pretty flexible and dynamic, so the, the ways that I'm trying to break it um, might not actually be good enough. Um, so let me, let me try something else here. I think in false, let's um, maybe make this a string. No, nope. I'm, I'm kind of taking shots in the dark here. Um, but what I can do is I can open up uh, that other project, projects, and I can show you here again. If we, uh, this was my test VI, that one is working. But if I run that. You can see, basically, if I double-click that, it takes me to the part of the code that broke. It's, it's not giving me kind of lots of details about the actual data. I think that may be in the report. So the user interface right now is pretty simple and not extremely featureful, but those are areas that we're considering adding. Okay. And so let's go back to high level VI. Which is the Karaya. And I'll run this. And what we can see, it actually ran all of these tests. And you can see there's a whole lot of tests. And you can just imagine that if I'm in there trying to play with the way the recursion works and maybe I'm experimenting between like using a native uh, recursion calling a, a VI calling itself recursively versus using like a while you can shift register approach. I would really want to be able to validate that all of my test cases pass while I'm doing that. Um, you can also see too, uh, um, you might want to do some performance tests. I think these aren't actually integrated yet into Araya itself. But performance testing is another important part. And a lot of us create our performance tests, which are themselves VIs. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, and maybe what I'll do is go to the um, Karaya page. Wait, what's that? No, the Karaya wasn't doing the performance testing right there. That was just a separate VI he had in there. Um, so there's another VI in here. Let's see if I can see this easily from my view. Okay, Karaya palette. The uh, define suite. So the define suite function 
allows you to uh, basically generate a report from all the tests that run, and that report is in a text file format. Um, we're also uh, looking at supporting the ANT, ANT test report format, which is used by um, like Jenkins for um, being able to pull into its uh, unit test results tracking capabilities with the results of all the tests so that you can track over when you get your emails. It'll do some reporting and stuff for you too. Okay, let me jump back here. Let's see where we are. All right, so um, I'm kind of at a point where I'm kind of tying things up, so I'll open it up now to some questions. We've had a couple so far. Does anybody else have questions, comments? Yeah? Um, when you go to pull this out, is, it, is there like any of your sensory required to lobotomize pariah? Like, let's say you're, you're building an application and then go look for a run on a, a runtime engine mm -hmm. on a server. Yeah. That's a good question. So um, the, the tests that I showed for the like JSON library and even the tests that, um, that I did in my Hello World, the, the test VIs, the ones that said, hi, I'm a test, right? It said like register me as a test with a name and then it called the assertion VI. I was actually calling my VI under test, right? I called my VI, I got the string output, and I tested that to my expected result. The, the tests that we were doing also here in this, uh, this VI called test round trip, um, this VI and all of my tests aren't actually in, they aren't actually being called by any of the code in my component that I'm shipping. They're in a separate folder called tests. One of the things about Karaya is it is also an assertion framework. And what you can do is, I think, kind of what you're thinking of. Let me find the Karaya documentation page. And I didn't get too much into that right now because um, I wanted to focus on the unit testing. So. Uh, this is kind of a unit test where we're testing, right now we're testing the plus function. And we would name this VI test addition. And so this would be considered a unit test and not part of the shipping code. However, if, if we wanted to drop this little snippet of code inside of our VI that does set pump speed. So let's just imagine that this little block of code is on the left hand side of set pump speed, and we want to assert that pump speed should always be greater than zero, but less than five. This will generate a runtime error that can then be caught somewhere. And um, that is often helpful for catching, if you know when you're doing development, sort of when there's insane conditions, um, this can catch that. This has been designed to be very light. You can build it in your executable and ship it with your application, and there's, there is overhead, but there's minimal overhead in doing it. Um, and it's, I, I believe it's even designed to know when it's running in an executable mode, so that it's even more performant than when it's running in the development mode um, as a test. So that's a good question. Uh, I think assertions and how to use them and best practices and stuff would be uh, NI Week 2017, perhaps. Yeah, Alan. Uh, so the question uh, was, do we have reporting? Yeah, we do have a text reporting. And so um, basically kind of all the scaffold for doing it is there. It, the format, I believe, is not the ant format. Uh, it's all open source, and under the hood, it's highly object-oriented and extensible and overridable and stuff. So it should be really easy to, to generate AMP reports, and that's on our radar, too. Yeah. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, we are.
you, you, you're talking about, can, can you explain what you mean about uh, using this with the CI tool? Are you, are you referring to well, integrating Karaya into the Jenkins build process? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Tomi has a VI that he created, if I'm looking, if you go into VIPM and search for Karaya, he has command line Karaya, um, which is in our internal res library right now, but I think the intention is to put that also on GitHub so that it can be called uh, easily by Jenkins. So that's definitely of interest to us. Sure, yeah, uh-huh. Other questions? Yeah. When a test runs, is it basically only a pass fail that the developers report it up to the framework, or is there an option to have, you know, contextual description of why this fails and then see your results in some way? Maybe in the test you're able to know why it fails. Um, let's, let's, let's do, we're, we're doing pretty good on time. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and take a look and see. I'll go to my simple demo here, and then I'm going to create a new VI, and then I'm going to try calling that one. Can't save here. Let's put that. Oh, I was doing recursion. Okay, I grabbed the wrong one. There, that works. And so that's my test. And then this is my suite. And then let's find the, um, pop that up. So that was, once it's installed, that's under the JKI toolkits. Karaya. In that, we'll create a test suite, and we'll destroy it, and then I should probably do some errors, create control, okay, and then what we do is we just wire this results through, and I'll, hello, test suite. And then I'll say interactive to false. By default, it's false. So it's not going to pop up the dialog. And then my report path, I'll just create a um, constant. And just put it right explore here. Okay, so I'm creating a file called simpledemo.txt. I'm going to run that. Surprise, that popped up the interactive. And then we'll go back to... Hmm. All right. I don't see a file, so I might be doing something wrong here. Okay, so that's, that's currently the format. Um, all that data is being passed into Karaya, so I think it's probably just the report generator that's currently being kind of plugged into it. Um, but again, that's all open source and it's part of a next step. I agree with you guys that it would be useful to see those. I'll take the one in back who hasn't asked a question yet and then we'll get to you. Um, I don't have hard data on that. Um, I, I believe that these assertion VIs are, are pretty fast. I'm, I'm drilling down uh, into them right now to basically see what's being called. 
and if it's already been called, it's basically just has an object, so that's probably super fast. And then the this is just getting a call chain, and then running the assert. Um, I know uh, one of the things Tommy did was making sure that when, when it has the results, in a lot of ways, a lot of the work isn't being done synchronously. So it actually it sends, sends it someplace so that it can actually be handled asynchronously. But I don't have specific numbers for you. OK. What time is this over? 3.15? OK. Um, question? Uh, in my experience, you get about 25 unhappy paths for every happy path in terms of testing. OK. The path is the ideal set of inputs, and it could you know, go through the okay. Okay. Uh -huh. your system, comes out, does what you want. Yeah. Um, I can imagine for a decent size app having a 1,000 paths. Is there any way to kind of put these things in a large machine in the hopper that makes Mm. Um, well, so we had several tests inside of one VI. Each of those could themselves be one test. So the way, the way that that was being done inside of the JSON tests, if we went kind of down into the lowest, no, that wasn't the test, that was performance. If we went down into the low level tests, we saw that there were several from, organized from top to bottom. Um, I think uh, that was just what Tommy did out of convenience because he kind of wanted to group them that way. Um, we could totally make just this one test and then the next one, one test. Um, and so was your concern about kind of the vertical block diagram space like I'm kind of showing you here? Like if you had a thousand, you're worried about having to scroll a thousand times? Well, or were you worried about having a thousand VIs for your thousand tests? I'm gonna break something. Yeah. I know. Um, I'd really like to have a diagram about that size and some sort of, um, here's a spreadsheet that lists out what the inputs are and what I want the things to be named what the target output should be. Yeah. And then uh -huh. you run against the rows. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's helpful uh, for storing, let's say, test vectors. And that's kind of how the, the, NI, the LabVIEW unit test framework kind of works, is it sort of kind of organizes test vectors and expected results. Um, and you could pretty easily do something like that, um, you know, Create some, and Karaya could have a reusable component for you know loading that. But um, it, it's a good point. Um, the I, I think typically for unit test frameworks, they often um, you want one unit test for one condition, so that when it breaks, you know exactly kind of what broke, and that you certainly could ex basic. I think what you're, we're kind of saying here is if we have a set of test vectors in a file with expected results, each of those is one unit of testing. And so when there is a failure, we want to trace it back to, well, which vector failed it? Um, and so this doesn't specifically do that. Um, and I think what you're describing is, is that in some cases, having those unit tests, those vectors, in a spreadsheet format file is a convenient place to add new ones and edit them, and that's that's a valid thing to want in, in cases where it makes sense. Yeah, Alan. You could you could take to a certain group of tests in array. Yeah. Yeah. The the one one thing about that too is when there's a failure. Often we want to kind of go right back to the fit, like we want to go, okay, double click the failure, let's go to the code, and then let's tweak the code and just run that one. And so if I'm, if I'm just trying to pinpoint on that one, it would be nice to have a convenient way to basically just focus on running, the, running that block of code with that one vector. Um, so yeah, it's 
Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing we'll have to think about. Yeah, another question in the middle here. Question. Uh, the hardest thing for me with unit testing is I've got a whole bunch of hardware dependencies. And does your framework have anything to support uh, stubbing up the hardware? Um, not specifically a feature to support stubbing up the hardware, but I, I'm presuming you could use Karai and stub out the hardware. Um, I think, are you, are you interested in using this to test the hardware or design tests where you can kind of like swap sort of a mock object in instead of the hardware? Right. I, what yeah. I typically have to mm -hmm. do is have a simulation yeah. of the hardware that mm -hmm. I then have to stop in. Yeah, exactly. Well, that work is often kind of separate from a test framework, and what I, what I might do is if I had like um, some stage business logic that required motors, um, and that stage logic, you know, knows how to kind of coordinate two axes, I might create a simulated axis, two simulated axes that have the behaviors that I want, um, and then construct those mock objects and then as part of my setup for the test and then pass them into the VI under test and then call my assertion checks to see if it worked correctly. And so creating those simulated components um, would be the same work regardless of whether we were using VI tester or would be using Karaya. If I'm starting to really kind of test object-oriented components, I might lean towards using VI tester personally um, although I, I think Karaya can do just as good of a job, probably. Yeah, in back. It seems like that's kind of going beyond the scope of, of testing. Integration end to end, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Um, these frameworks are also just as useful for doing integration testing as they are for unit testing. The integration testing, uh, integration tests often take longer to execute because there's, there's so much more of the code that's being executed under the hood. And then additionally, there's the construction of a lot of mock objects where there may be an integration test that's actually testing a real database, real hardware, real databases, and there's a lot of kind of setup conditions that need to happen. So we might start to organize our tests. Uh, I might have a top level like software unit tests, and then I might have you know in simulated integration tests, and then I might have hardware integration tests. I might have hardware integration tests for station A and hardware integration tests for station B. And under the hood, I might be reusing a lot of the different tests, but I might be setting them up differently and passing different constructed objects in there. And then when we get into Jenkins, the continuous integration build server, I would probably you know, make sure that's running the unit test plus the simulated integration tests, even though they might take longer to execute you want those running every day versus you probably want your your developers while they're developing code every once in a while hitting kind of the run button on all the unit tests before they like check in check in their code at the end of the day and say it's working uh, so uh, what what we see when we're shipping a commercial software product or something uh, that that needs to be of robust commercial industrial quality is that software testing is really important and it's not just kind of like a trivial thing that we do at the end of the project. It's something we think about from the start. We start laying the foundation, we choose the tools, we organize like the hierarchy of our tests and the organization and the code. Um, for, for large software products and especially things that are like frameworks and like operating systems and things like that, the um, the code in, in the unit tests and the integration tests, that code base can be much larger than the actual code base of the product. Because if you can imagine something like Microsoft Windows, like all the possible permutations 
of things that could be installed and different ways the users could be using it, the different architectures it's installed on, that actually testing all the conditions that it could be called on is actually much greater than the actual code base itself. I think just like you were saying kind of up front here, it's like I've got like, you know, a thousand ways it could go wrong. Well, you should write tests for those thousands of ways it could go wrong. Um, but again, we have to balance that between, you know, um, getting the code working versus verifying that it will work under all conditions. And so um, finding the right balance is important in the project. We don't want to slow things down so far up front and have a fully validated set of software that doesn't actually deliver any business value to the customers, right? Because, oh, we actually got the requirements wrong or they don't think this is very usable. So it's often helpful to just kind of do something light, get it out, and once we get feedback, then start to do more testing. But we want to make the testing as easy as possible in the process, and hopefully uh, Karaya uh, delivers on that. Yeah, Alan? So what's the fate of the I question? The fate? Uh, it will live indefinitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, your VI is the test. It's easy to run, and it's fast and it makes monkey sounds. Uh, so if you'd like to get it, again, just uh, Google Karaya, JKI, and you can find it on uh, GitHub. You can download it with VI Package Manager. Uh, if you have any questions, feedback, want to participate in the development, help make it better, uh, complain, whatever you want to do, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach out to me or Tommy or any of our social networks. Thanks, everybody.